Um, before we turn to Scripture, this Thursday going into Friday uh, was the Passover. And uh, as we discussed last, was it last year? Last year, summertime, I did a message on blood moons. Uh, even lost a family over it. They didn't like what I had to teach. Um, I cannot tell you whether or not Jesus Christ is coming back tomorrow. I can't. No man knows the day or the hour. Amen. And I would not be so arrogant as to say so, but you know what? The times and the seasons are upon us. And those who do not see that, I believe, do not want to see that. So anyhow, this week we had um, what they call, what is it called, the quatrains of, of blood moons? That means it's basically, last year we had a blood moon. What's a blood moon? It's, you know, it's an atmospheric thing that happens. It's fairly miraculous, but not too, too miraculous. Where the blood appears in a full moon, it, it appears red. Okay? We call it a blood moon. Uh, in history, it has appeared on the Passover day, uh, and then to follow the Feast of Tabernacles, and then the following year, Passover Day and Feast of Tabernacles. I mean, for that to happen two years in a row, boom, 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 to line up is miraculous. The mathematics we did behind it, it's miraculous. And with every one of those events, something significant happens in the history of the nation of Israel. Well, unfortunately, America is now involved in it. This Passover, this blood moon, by the way, there's one more left. We had two last year. There's one to come in October. Um, on this Passover day, with a blood moon in the sky, the leaders of our country signed an agreement with the Prince of Persia. If you want to know who's the Prince of Persia, uh, you read the book of Daniel sometime. The land of Persia, which would include Iran, Iraq, um, the Assyrian region, if you will, they, um, they have a demonic spirit that rules that area. I never heard of such things. Surely he's crazy. Well, I believe the Bible. He's referred to as the Prince of Persia. If you want to know why that area likes to cut people's heads off, it has nothing to do with Jesus <laughs> Christ or even religion. It has to do with what they believe in the demonic spirit that overpowers them there. Just speaking the truth. Our government agreed with Iran against Israel on the blood moon, on their Passover. Cross the table with the Prince of Persia. We're in trouble. I'm not trying to be gloom and doom. It's Resurrection Sunday. I know. I wanted to bring this out because, folks, the time is short. You better see what's going on out there, and you better get on Jesus' side. Because he's coming back, and when he comes back, you better hope you're on his side. All right. We all feeling good? Come on, lift up your head. Your redemption draweth nigh. All right, let's get, let's get to Matthew chapter 26. And while you're turning there, I'll get us prepared with, with prayer. <clears throat> Matthew 26. Father, I just ask now that you teach us this morning by thy spirit through thy word. Uh, teach us things that we've never considered before. Enlighten our eyes. We want to behold wondrous things out of thy law this morning. And I pray, Lord God, that as we read, that those words would work effectually in our lives. That we would see Jesus for who he is. Who he always will be. The only Savior this world will ever know. And I pray, Lord God, that we'd be prepared to put our trust, our faith in him this morning. Move through this congregation now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Matthew 26, verses 36 through 38. What we're doing here this morning is giving you a message called The Temptation, Trial, and Triumph of Jesus Christ. Um, every once in a while, I cheat a little bit. 
This is a message I did back in 2009. So I'm just bringing it. It's 2015. You have no idea. You Believe me, you won't remember it. <laughs> Trust me. I think I could probably come back a year later and give you messages all through. The <laughs> You'd be like, oh, oh, okay, good. I never heard that before. It's just we have short memories. It's not anything negative against you or, or, or against me. It's just that we have short memories. Amen? So let's remember the temptation, trial, and triumph of Jesus Christ this morning. Matthew 26, verses 36 through 38. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. We sang about that this morning. La last song that we did, Lest I Forget, Gethsemane. And saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Now notice that wording in verse 37. It says he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. <coughs> That's curious. Jesus had just been betrayed by, G by Judas. A man he actually refers to in the, in the Old Testament Psalms as his friend, his acquaintance, his familiar acquaintance. Jesus just been betrayed by him. Jesus had just made the comment that all of his disciples, back in Matthew 26, verse 31, that they would soon be offended by him. Anyone here ever been offended by Jesus? No, no, never, never, never. Jesus had just listened as Peter zealously defended the, his heartfelt belief that he would never be offended at, by Jesus. Never. I'd be willing to die for you, Jesus. But Jesus knew the truth. All of this had just happened, but the scripture says that it wasn't until he reached the garden known as Gethsemane that he began to be sorrowful. Why is that? All right, Isaiah chapter 50. And I have to let your fingers do some walking this morning. Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 7. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned. Before I even begin reading, let me explain this to you. This is a prophetic reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll make a little more sense to you when we get down to uh, verses 6 and 7, but uh, all of this is about Jesus, okay? Verse uh, 4 again. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Right? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest, Jesus said. He speaks. He has a tongue that speaks unto the weary. Can I get a witness out there? Amen. Okay. He, wake, he wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. The Lord Jesus Christ, he knew no sin. He never rebelled against the commandment of God. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. You think about that. My, my little boy the other day, he was rubbing my arm while I was reading Charlotte's Web to him. He's rubbing my arm. And his palms were a little uh, moist. And he tugged on a hair and, ow, you know, he got, got a hair. That hurt, one little hair. The Lord faced people who grabbed his beard and ripped it out. Just a little... Something to think about. See Selah. Gave my back to the smiters, my cheek to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. I can think of nothing worse on a humiliating factor than to spit directly into somebody's face. Not once, but many times over, people spat in Jesus' face. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint and I know that I shall not be ashamed. See, the Lord Jesus Christ, he set himself in a direction like an adamant flint, like a rock. I'm going to perform a task and though all this stuff happens around me, I will not be moved. 
set my face like a flint. What made Jesus leave his home in glory only to walk this clay earth? He set his face like a flint. What made Jesus give up that crown for a lowly manger? He set his face like a flint. What made Jesus endure the mocking of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the great religious leaders of their day? He set his face like a flint. What made him enter that garden of temptation? He set his face like a flint. So what does it all mean? It means that he had decided in eternity past that he would be willing to be a sacrifice for all a fallen man and there was nothing that was going to get in the way of him accomplishing that goal. Nothing. Isaiah 38, you're close by. I want to show you something. This is a great verse. Anyone here ever in track? No? No track runners? What? Madonna! Hey, you were in track. I just, I, it's... <laughs> Madonna ran track, hallelujah. Do you got video? I need proof. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Isaiah 38, verse 20. You, know, you get ready for track, what do you do? I mean, you line up on a line, you put your finger on a line, you wait for a gunshot. Right? You wait for that whistle to go off. Look at verse 20. The Lord was ready to save me. Think about that in light of a track meet. He was ready. He was just waiting for that moment in eternity when he would come to earth. When that gun would go off and he'd set his face like a flint, running to the end of that race. Hallelujah. The Lord, Lord's been, he's been ready for millennia, folks. He had a plan mapped out for you who wasn't even a thought. Millennia ago, ready to save you. Like a track star Amen. waiting to jump that hurdle of Calvary for you. Amen. Mark chapter 14. I don't want to hear anything about what kind of a loving God would send somebody to hell. He's been ready to save you for thousands of years. If you don't want to be saved, it's because you don't want Him. Mark 14. Verses 35 and 36. And he went forward a little. This is him in the garden again. Just a different account from a different gospel. He went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Now listen, listen. His face, you said, preacher, you just said his face was set like an, like an adamant flint. Now all of a sudden he's seeming to want to back out of it. He is not wanting to back out of going to a cross for you here, folks. This is not what's grieving him here, folks. I, I'm going to show you. Go to Luke chapter 22. Let's, let's go there. He had ex The man Christ Jesus was in great sorrow. Of course, the God Christ Jesus knew that he had a job to do. But Luke 22, verses 43 and 44, there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. This is while he's in the garden, right? He's getting some help. Glory, hallelujah. We can all use some help from time to time. Amen. And even the man Christ Jesus needed a little strengthening. Verse 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Well, what do we do when we're in agony? Forsake God, cuss God out, blame him for the agony, or do we pray more earnestly? And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Well, I just don't believe that that is molecularly possible. Science, just a, yeah, science. 
Science proves everything, doesn't it? Like you are a monkey. <laughs> Science got nothing on the Bible. What horror, what horror a soul must have been in to cause such physical reaction, such a chemical reaction within the body that great drops of blood would pour out of the pores. By the way, this has happened to people in the past. This isn't scientifically impossible. The thing is that so many people, uh, what they refer to, the thing is, is, that, is that it's Jesus going to the cross and to the crucifixion that he is so uh, broken about. But that the, the reason why that blood is pouring out of him at this moment here and as he's in great agony in that garden. And people want to say that it's about the crucifixion. It is not about the crucifixion. It is about the cup that he is about to partake in. You say, well, that's the crucifixion. No, it is not. That cup that he was about to drink was filled with your sin. It was filled with my sin. That cup had poured into it every wicked thought you've ever had. Every wicked deed you've ever done. Every desire your flesh is sought after in contradiction to what God has commanded for you in your life. Every willful rebellion against God poured in. Poured in the cup of wrath, the cup of wrath, the cup of wrath, getting higher, getting higher, getting to the full mark. And Jesus drank that. Mm -hmm. That cup Jesus wanted re removed from him was not the crucifixion. It was what would become, what would cause him to become sin on the cross of Calvary. Say, so what do you mean by that? Jesus, Jesus, he knew no sin. Relax. Let me show you. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I am not teaching the false teachings of Benny Hinn that Jesus ceased to be God on the cross and that he became fully wicked, wicked man. I do not believe that. Jesus knew no sin. But in God's reckoning, Jesus became something. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. For he, God the Father, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Wow! It repeated! That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Just play it here. We'll put it right here. Just. It creeps me out a little bit. I got to be honest with you. Can I repeat this verse now? Because it's an all-important verse. Shut that. Th step on it if you got to. Just because I, I don't want to be scared. You got a devil spirit in there. Go conjure that thing out of there. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That's what he didn't want. Why? Because that's what would ultimately break his fellowship with the Father. Right, amen. amen. That's right. Your sins have separated between you and your God. He put all of the sins on Jesus Christ, punished him on the cross, and turned away from his son. That is what Jesus did not want. Amen. He always had a perfect relationship with God the Father. Right. And God the Father did not want to see his son in that condition. He turned away. You, what, God, what God is loving? You send me to hell. The God who made his son sin for you and punished him for you. you. Look back, Numbers 21 on your own time. Galatians 3 and verse 13. Jesus became a curse. Cursed is every man that hangeth on a tree. 
Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9, talk about the fiery serpent that was hung up on the pole in the wilderness. <laughs> Who's a serpent? <laughs> Satan. Yet in the Levitical law, in the book of Numbers, it said, look to this and live. Look and li we sing that song, look and live. You know. Why? It wasn't a picture of Jesus hanging on the cross. It was a picture of sin hanging on the cross. It was fulfilled in Jesus Christ who was made sin for us. It's a great picture. That was Jesus' temptation. That was his agony. He wanted out of that cup. I don't blame him. But, aren't you glad that he said, nevertheless, thy will be done? Amen. Would to God that we all said things like that when we didn't want to do something God asked us to do. All right, let's move on to the trial. John chapter 18. John 18, verses 3 through 6. I don't know what you believe here this morning. I, there are many here faces that I've never seen before. I have no idea what you believe. I'm not going to be afraid to tell you what I believe. Amen. And it's, I hope you don't perceive it as arrogant, though you may, and that's understandable. I just believe this book so much. I've read it enough times to know that man could not, would not have written this book. It is so contrary to everything a man believes about himself. Why would he write it? Why, no, why would 40 plus authors over a 1600 year period all agree upon something that would ultimately send them to their death? You think about that. John 18. So I'm just going to preach to you what I believe this morning and, and I hope you believe it because I'll tell you what, it changed my life. Not only did it change my life, it changed my eternity. Amen. Gave me eternal life. John 18 verses 3 through 6. Judas then, having received a band of men, we talked about Judas betraying him, and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. <laughs> Think Judas, having seen all those miracles for three and a half years, might have thought, hey, maybe we need to bring a few weapons. <laughs> just, I don't know, just a thought. Verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? See, he came right out and he approached them. He didn't hide. They're coming, coming with him, you know, like, a, like someone coming for the Frankenstein monster with torches and lanterns. Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. How significant is that? Well, it says, And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Amen. I love this account. We want Jesus. I'm he. It's almost as if someone touched their forehead. <laughs> I just throw that out for you. We've discussed this the last couple of weeks. When Moses asked God, what's your name? He said, I am that I am. When the Jewish leaders wanted to know about who Jesus was, he says, before Abraham was, I am. He identified himself as that burning bush, God. He identified himself as God. You say, well, that's not what it says. It certainly was. Uh, the Sadducees and Pharisees wouldn't have picked up rocks to throw at him. They knew what he said. Right. What you see right here as he responds in the same way, he's not, they're about ready to drag God off to a cross and kill him. And he lets them know just a little bit of that power lying within him and what he could do with them. We want Jesus. I am he. Boom, on the backs they went. Read Isaiah 28 on your own sometime. Mm -hmm. The enemies of God fall backwards. Right. 
Amen. You watch all those guys on TV. The hair and the pear. Benny H hair and the pear. That's Jan and Paul Crouch. She's got that pink hair that's this big. You ever seen her before? A little dog that's this big, pink too. Mascara covered all over her face. Crazy looking. They're crazy people. I don't know what people send money to those people? You like just throwing money in the garbage? Support something that's real. Anyhow, those guys, they're all doing the slain in the spirit stuff. People fall backwards all the time. I want to let you know that the enemies of God fall backwards in God's presence. You want an example of what someone who belongs to God will do in the presence of God? Read Revelation and they fall on their face before his feet. They do not fall backwards at his power, they fall forward in worship. You want an example of that here on earth? Is anyone here trust Jesus Christ? Anyone born again here? Okay, so you have become a child of God, a son of God by receiving Jesus Christ, amen? John 1 verse 12. Well, as a son, as a child, you're supposed to have a good relationship with your daddy. And if you got a good daddy, and I understand that out in that wicked world, there's some very wicked daddies. And I'm sorry if you've been raised by one. I was not raised by any. So I feel your pain at least on some level. But God the Father's always, since six years old and up, he's been my dad. Um, but my boys in the morning... You know, before they wipe the crusties out of their eyes, they run into my office where I've been working for the last two hours, reading scriptures, praying, um, praying for you, love you. Um, and they come running into the office and embrace me. And they come sit in my lap because we have a relationship. See, now, if I was a, a bad man and approaching a child, that wasn't mine, they would fall back. Rightly so. But if you're one of his, the reaction shouldn't be this. I fear that it is sometimes. It should be this. So let's just help you along. Not backwards. You see those guys on TV? Some of them are the enemies of God. Some of them are just plain out ignorant of what the scripture teaches. Okay, Matthew chapter 27. <coughs> By the way, I think they knock people out, lay them on the floor, and then they get one of their guys to pull the wallet out of the back pocket while they're laying there. I think that's the whole gist of the show. Matthew 27. <laughs> I'm going to go to one of those things sometime. Preach outside and then go in and watch the show. Just, I'm going to leave my wallet at home. Versus, can you get into one of those things without paying? Churches are just like that too. Nobody asked you for anything here. I bet you're, I'm waiting for that plate to get passed. That won't happen. Matthew 27, verses 11 through 14. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. But what does that mean? So some people, they misinterpret that, and they go, Well, that's Jesus. Jesus was saying, Well, that's what you're calling me. No, he's saying, You got it. That's how modern vernacular would be today. Yeah. Art thou the king of the Jews? You got it. Amen. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. So you got Pilate going, wait a minute, they're, they're accusing you of this, 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 and this. Do you hear that? Don't you know I have the power to kill you right now? Pilate's just staring at him like, who is this guy? <laughs> anyone here, come on, anyone here ever been accused of something that you know you didn't do? Let me ask you a question. When you were accused of such,
did you keep your mouth quiet or did you vehemently <laughs> argue the point? No, 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 I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't. Right, come on. Not Jesus. Why? Fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah 53, verse 7 says this about Jesus. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. That's Isaiah 53, written roughly 712 B.C. So roughly 700 years before Jesus showed up. Amen. Fulfilled to the T. They brought him as a, as, a, as a sheep before the slaughter. And he opened out his mouth. Fulfilled prophecy. What restraint. What power to resist temptation. I'm telling you, folks, we got a great God. Amen. Now, John 18. Let's get over there. John 18. Verses 19 through 23. For those of you who don't know me very well, this is why I bring you to a lot of Scripture because I want you to know that what I'm teaching you is Bible. It's not traditions of men. It's not my traditions. It's, it's not what the Pope tell, told me to say. It is not written in the Catechism. Couldn't care less if it was. Um, it is what the Bible says. And so you can check what I have to say with the Bible. And uh, 1 John 4 and verse 1 says, Try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So you need to try me, my spirit, and what I teach you. And I'm okay with that. Okay, I'm okay with that. Just do it by the Bible and do it without slapping me in the face if you could. Amen? That's it. That's all. All right, John 18, verses 19 through 23. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Folks, get this now. Christians, get this now. Where's this Jesus going to show up out of the sky? Let him tell us. No, it's our job. Jesus taught you something out of this book, amen? Let your mouth speak it. That's what he said. They heard me. Go ask them. If you want to know whether or not it's your responsibility to share Jesus Christ with others, right here it is. Um, behold, they know what I said, and when he had thus Spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand. Saying, answerest thou the high priest so? This man had more respect for a man in a long robe called a high priest than he did for the Son of God standing in front of him. Jesus answered him, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Is that how you would have responded? <laughs> yeah. Oop. Can you imagine an officer of the law striking someone on trial in, a, in an American court? Had an officer struck Charlie Manson, Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Kaczynski, that would be the uni bomber. Or anyone like that, the newspapers would have actually cried out in their defense, police brutality. Right? Am I right? I think I'm right. But here is the innocent blood. The innocent son of the living God standing on trial for what? Telling you the truth. And these men had nothing to accuse him of, so they figured, well, we're just, he's just aggravating us. We're just going to beat him. hair out. At one point in time, they put a bag over his head and just started buffeting him. Who's hitting you? Prophesy. Who's hitting you?
Matthew 26. Not only did they beat him, Matthew 26. This is, this is during court, folks. This is a legal hearing. 59 through 61. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though the many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. So what, what's going on here? Well, Jesus has no sin to be accused of, no reason ever to be even brought before a court, let alone be accused of sin or, and that which is worthy of death. So they do two things to him. They beat him and just send some people in to make some stuff up about him. This trial is the greatest miscarriage of justice in the history of all human legal systems. You need to understand that. It was, this was unfair. What happened to Jesus is unfair. And he had the power to stop it and he didn't for you. All he could have said to that person getting ready to smack him was, I am he. Could have. If I had the power, I would have. I am he. I am he. I am he. I am he. Just watch them all. Boom, boom, boom. But I'm a man. He didn't. Just blows my mind. Matthew 27. You're close by. So Jesus goes to the cross where the reality of becoming sin for us comes to pass. Matthew 27, verse 46. Watch this now. Next time you want to talk about a God who is unloving, you watch this. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Okay, let's keep reading. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I got you in the wrong place. Luke 23. So it's in this moment here. Let me explain this and then I'll get you to that verse that I wanted to show you. Um, it's in this moment that God the Father turns his back on God the Son. He has literally become that cursed sin in a human body covered with my filth, covered with your filth. And yet for all that Jesus suffered, for all the false testimony, for all the beatings, for all the mockery, for all the lies, Jesus cries out unto the Father on that cross, Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do you know what the penalty in the Old Testament law was for putting an innocent man to death? Capital punishment. Death. But what happens if a man ignorantly killed in the Old Testament law? He was allowed to go grab onto the horns of the altar and seek sanctuary and refuge. We call it what? Manslaughter. Accidental killing. When Jesus is on that cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, he lowered the charge of Israel and the Roman Empire from murder one to manslaughter so that they didn't all die. Amen. God's unloving. Send people to hell. He just spared all their lives right there. Father, don't consider this murder one. They're ignorant. They don't know why they're killing me. Manslaughter it is, son. Why? so that a Roman centurion who stood there watching it happen could believe and be saved. Amen. The one who led him to that cross could look up to him and say, this is the Son of God. Believe and be saved. And it wasn't counted against him. Why? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. 
John 20. All right, so we saw the temptation, we saw the trial, let's get to the triumph. John 20, first nine verses. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene, early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that would be John, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher, and he stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. That, the, what does that show? Activity in the tomb. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed, for as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. The Lord had just been with them, telling them, I'm going to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me, and I will rise from the dead. For they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. You say, wait a minute, that's a contradiction. No, it's not. How much have you read that you don't know? Why didn't they know it? He preached it over and over and over again because of this. Because they didn't want to know it. They didn't want to hear it. That's how it is with mankind. Jesus can stand right before you and tell you something over and over and over again for three and a half years, and if this is what you're doing, you'll never hear it. How often does God have to speak to you before you receive what he has to say to you? How are we doing? Everyone feeling okay? As that world out there, unbeknownst to them, celebrates the worship of the fertility goddess known as Ishtar, Eostre, or Easter, we gather together today to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Now, we've done the study. Uh, we've concluded that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was not on Friday. Book of Luke, you need a, few, you need a bunch of scriptures, but you, when you do the study out, Jesus was crucified on a Wednesday. It was not in December. That, oh, that's different. It was not in December that he was born. It was in September that he was born. So all that stuff that people celebrate out there is just traditions, traditions of men. I had a guy come up to me um, uh, Wednesday, was it Wednesday? No, Thursday morning. And he comes up to me. He knows I'm a pastor. You know, I, I work a secular job out of here for those who, who don't know me. And he came up and he says, so, he says, are you having a, a Maud A Thursday service uh, tonight? And I looked at him and I go, a what? He's like, a Maud A Thursday. I go, what's a Maud A Thursday? What, what does Maud A mean? I have no idea what this stuff is. See, I'm not religious. So he says, well, that's, you know, we celebrate the day that Jesus had the Last Supper. And I went, oh. How do you have the Last Supper after he died? <laughs> and he's like, what? I go, he died on a Wednesday. So, oh, well, it's Friday. I said, no, it's not. So, oh, well, I said, listen, I go, Tim, he's a brother. He's a brother in the Lord. He's just very traditional. I said, Tim, I, I'm really not religious. I just believe the Bible. And he, said, he looks at me and goes, oh, okay, well, that's a good start. <laughs> but do you see religious man? It's a good place to start. Let me start adding traditions. Let me start adding standards. Let me start adding things that have nothing to do with the Bible. Before you know it, you're celebrating, I don't know, a bunny. Thank you, Pastor. We love it when you talk about this stuff. Amen. <laughs> Laying all that 
that aside, why, if Jesus did get crucified on a Friday, why would you call it good? Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's, that's right. <sighs> See, now we, you know what we do in regards to Christ's death? We, you know, what is referred to as communion, I call it the Lord's table. We don't make merry over his death. It's not merry Christ's death. Merry Christ Mass. Mass means death. Just throwing that out there, too. We're all having fun. It's snowing out, so I figured I'd throw Christmas in, too. Um, but we do memorialize it. Amen? I memorialize the fact that he went to that cross for me. He spilled his blood for me. But I joy in his resurrection. He defeated Satan. He defeated death in the grave. He walked out of that tomb triumphantly. He ascended up to the Father. He's sitting on the right hand of the majesty on high. Come on, it's not Easter Sunday any more than Friday was Good Friday. It's Resurrection Sunday. And why don't we just start calling that Good Sunday? Because that's good. Now, John 20, we're there. Look at verses 26 and through 28. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. You know, maybe I ought to start. Yeah, no, that's it. Yeah, no, start in verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve called uh, Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciple there, therefore, said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my fingers into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Any people like that out there? Well, unless I see Jesus with my eyes, I'm not going to believe. Good thing for Thomas that Jesus was still walking the earth for a few days until Pentecost. After the eighth day, or after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. <laughs> All of a sudden, there's Jesus. Boop. That's going to happen to us, folks. All of a sudden, there's Jesus. Boop. Hope you're ready. Then saith he to Thomas, <coughs> Can you imagine this now? You're, you're doubting Thomas. I will not believe. He All of a sudden, he's in the middle of the room. He says, Peace to everyone. They he turns right to Thomas. <laughs> you don't see me, you don't see me, you don't see me, right? Oh, where am I? Uh, he says unto Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. Amen. Next verse. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Amen. Jesus was tempted in that garden of Gethsemane to forsake that cup of sin. He chose to do the will of the Father for you, for me. Then he was put on trial for crimes he never committed. Spit on, slapped, hit over the head with a reed, mocked, beard plucked out of him, nails driven into his hands, spear into his side, thorns into his forehead, spilling that precious, sinless blood for you, for me. He did the work. He paid the price. Jesus paid it all. A one-time sacrifice. You do not need to keep eating wafers. That is not the body of Jesus Christ. It already happened. That body of Jesus Christ, it went to a cross. It came up out of a tomb. It ascended on high. It's not in a round orb. And nowhere in the Bible does it teach that it is. One-time sacrifice, not over and over and over again. That's what they're doing with the Mass. They're just killing them over and over and over again. That's blasphemy. Amen. I've never heard a preacher talk like this. Surely you're hate-filled. I'm not hate-filled. I love you guys. I want you to be saved. Amen. Jesus paid it all. So what's my part? Same thing, Thomas. What did Thomas do? 
Nothing. But accepted who Jesus was. Got down onto his knees, proclaimed that Jesus Christ was his Lord and his God. He put his full trust in what Jesus did, not what he did. Amen. And that is salvation. That is what the Bible refers to as being born again. A lot of people get these crazy notions that there's a bunch of nutty people out there because of what you see on TV. I don't blame you for thinking we're all a bunch of nuts for what you see on TV. All I can say is I, don't, I do not espouse what Benny Hinn espouses. I am not slapping anyone on foreheads, throwing my jackets at them, dancing around like a moron. I just want to show you what the Bible says. And I hope that you're willing to receive that. Because your soul depends upon it. And these are not my words, they're the words of the Lord. John chapter 3, Jesus looked at the most religious and good man he could find. He looked him eye to eye and said, ye must be born again to see the kingdom of God. That's right. What do you mean, me? I go to church. I was baptized. I go on Easter and Christmas. I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I've never killed anyone. Thomas could have said all the same thing. He didn't. He said, my Lord, my God. You're not good enough. He is. He's reaching a nail-pierced hand out to you. All that is required is for you to take it. And you do that by faith. You don't do it by eating a cracker. He didn't eat anything here. He just reached up to Jesus by faith. And Jesus called called him one of his own. This same doubting Thomas will later be martyred for his faith in Jesus Christ. Something to think about on Easter. Thank God he came out of that tomb. Can I close with that? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I have so much here, more that I wanted to share with you this morning, but we don't have the time. So let me close here who has, uh, like Thomas, gotten down on your knees, declared that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your God. You've been born again. You've been given newness of life by the Spirit of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. If that's you this morning, I got some good news. Amen. Say, isn't that good news? Oh, that's great news. I've got, I've got good news to follow. Verse 51 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That's a reference to dying. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall, all be, and we shall be changed. What's he talking about? A resurrection. We call this the rapture. It's the resurrection. For those who? Who's he writing to? Born again Christians. At Corinth. Some of them not even good born-again Christians, let's be honest. Because your goodness means nothing. Your faith in Jesus Christ will get you out of the judgment. Amen. Say, so, well, it makes no sense. God gave one way, folks. One way, and that way is Jesus Christ. Well, I don't understand. That's not fair to everybody. It's, so, it's certainly fair to everybody. Everyone gets one way. But it's available to everyone. Amen. See, the problem with mankind is he gave you one way, so you want two. If he gave you two, you'd want ten. If he gave you ten, you'd want eleven. You can have every tree but the one in the midst of that garden. I want that one in the garden. Amen. That's humanity. So he said one and that's it. Receive it or reject it. Reject it and you've rejected eternal life. Receive it and you received eternal life. And that life is in his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, let, he's, he's writing this to you who have received him. Anyone receive him? Amen. Okay. In a, uh, behold, I show you, mister, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal, I'm mortal, I'm going to die, right? Must put on immortality. Amen. 
So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. How? Not through eating a wafer, not through lighting a candle, not for church attendance, not for being a Baptist, not for being a Catholic, not for lighting candles, not for confessing to priests, but through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Come on, Christians, be steadfast. Unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When he raises you up, he's going to reward you for your work down here. You don't get saved by good works, but you will get rewarded for them. You get saved by Jesus. You get rewarded for what you've done after salvation. Amen? But we, our faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And we're coming out of those graves. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I come to you now in that name that is above every name, that, that name, Jesus Christ. I just want to thank you, Lord God, for filling your house this morning. It just uh, excites me to see so many faces out there, Lord. Happy to see them. Faces that I may never see again, Lord. This is my last shot. This may, may be my last shot to give them the truth through your scripture. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would just descend upon them right now and convict their hearts for those who have not trusted in Jesus Christ that you just might speak right into their ear and whisper, you know this is truth and you know right now it's not applying to you. The Holy Spirit of God, we expect that you will do all the convicting work that is necessary that you will do all the preaching that is necessary into the hearts and minds of people. Help them to understand that salvation is belief away. It's not even a prayer away. It's a heart belief away. Through faith in your blood. Believing in the heart, the Lord Jesus. Confessing made unto salvation. Father, if there's anyone here now that has yet to trust Jesus Christ, I don't like to do that. All eyes closed, all hands lit. Lord, you know their hearts. You've sent your spirit into them uh, as a candle according to the scripture that you might know their hearts. Lord God, if there's anyone here that says, that's me, I want to trust Jesus Christ, I want to be saved, I believe this is true, that right here, right now, that they would make that decision. And if so, that they'd be willing to say, that's me. I'll believe Jesus. For confession is made unto salvation. Father, we just want to thank you that you sent your son to die in our place. And we thank you that our hope was not lost, but that he came up out of that grave. And our recognition of such means that we're coming up out of those graves too. Thank you for it, Lord. Can't wait. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, for we pray it in your name. Amen.